much of social life is actually rooted in place, and specifically in the local neighborhood. Neighborhoods vary tremendously by all sorts of things. We know they vary by things like poverty, but poverty is also connected to many other things in social life, things like health, well-being. It's important to not only recognize the great deal of differences that exist across neighborhoods in the United States, it's also important to push a little bit further and try to figure out what is going on. So we were trying to say, let's put together the study of neighborhoods that takes into account these classic factors like poverty, like racial segregation, almost like a laser beam focus on the social quality, the social personality of neighborhoods, which requires a new kind of methodology. So we went door to door in Chicago, talking with about 9,000 residents. We asked them a host of questions about their own lives, but we also asked them about their interactions with neighbors, their perceptions, their fears. We went and interviewed them, and we came back about seven years later, and we took a new sample. So we got a picture of the dynamics of how neighborhoods changed from the perspective of residents, but that's not enough. Yeah, so one of our major objectives was to observe the streets of Chicago. To do that systematically, we drove down the streets in an SUV with cameras mounted in the back and filmed each side of the street. And we had our researchers code from the film systematically characteristics of the neighborhood. Who's on the street? Is there graffiti? Are there people hanging out, potentially fighting, yelling, cues of what social scientists often refer to as disorder? When you have neighborhoods that are in disarray, it's a cue to criminals in particular that no one cares about this neighborhood. So it's okay to go and steal, to victimize. It's going to attract offenders. Disorder, in a way, is kind of like crime. It's a manifestation. It's a symptom of a larger social problem that there are certain conditions in the neighborhood that are driving both the crime and the disorder. We also study the organizations in a neighborhood. That's crucially important because dimensions of resources and power exist in the organizations in a community. So we sampled the churches, the schools, we looked at the police department, businesses, real estate, 3,000 leaders in Chicago even the politicians. In some communities, you find the leaders are very tightly connected. They know one another. You can actually see it where there's lots of dense connections among all the leaders and maybe only one or two that are isolates. Whereas in another neighborhood, just a bunch of leaders not connected to others, maybe one or two cliques. Turns out that the communities where you have a more cohesive or connected structure among the leaders of organizations, they do better. In our study, we found that collective efficacy varied tremendously across neighborhoods. By collective efficacy, I mean the sense that residents trust one another and they believe that their neighbors will take action if there's a problem. Even in neighborhoods that have been battered by disorder, by poverty, by racial segregation, those things all, are all related to crime, but there's a certain sense in which the social infrastructure or the fabric can provide a kind of a buffer that leads to lower crime. In other words, inequality has multiple dimensions. It's a dimension of stratification by resources that are material in nature, but neighborhoods are also highly stratified by social characteristics. So now that we know that the social fabric of a community matters, we need to turn our attention to providing help to the communities that are in trouble when it comes to the social fabric. <laughs>